Amen. So many go. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم أما بعض فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Originally, the setup and the plan was to have two presenters for this particular issue, but due to the busy schedule of the one who was supposed to represent the side of the permissibility of eating commercial meat, it was decided that I just present both sides. We begin by making it very clear this issue is an issue of ikhtilaf between the scholars from a long time ago all the way up until today. And both sides have legitimate points of views. So no matter how much a person may dislike the idea and the thought of eating from McDonald's and Burger King and Kentucky Fried Chicken, no matter how much you think that's a bad thing, you have to understand, you have to appreciate and accept that major scholars of Al-Islam, far greater in their scholarly aptitude, they're far greater than the regular person from the Muslims who chooses to eat from those places. So therefore, you can't give a per person a tongue lashing, can't look at an individual who does that, who eats at those places with your nose up in the air. It's not permissible. Because if you're going to do that for him, you have to do that for those scholars who are much greater than him and greater than you, for that matter. Another issue that is overboard and we have to touch upon it is the extreme nature of those people who the person is drowning in different type of kabair. person is drinking khamr and the individual is using drugs the person is not praying gambling partying clubbing and when it comes to the issue of eating halal He's really big on that. 
She doesn't wear hijab. Person is not practicing the religion. But when it comes to this issue, you'll find as if this person is making this issue, this mas'ala on par with at tawheed or the kalima la ilaha illallah. So after a night of drinking, partying, and clubbing, the person will go and insist on only eating the dhabiha. That's overboard as well. Because it's like putting the cart before the horse. Eating correctly of what you believe is halal and staying away what you believe in is haram. That's an important issue in Islam. And the Muslim is responsible to be on top of that. Be careful about what you eat. Whether it's halal or haram and whether it benefits you or harms you. And so forth and so on. Does it make you lazy? Is it good for you? Is it bad for you? That's part of the religion. But... We just want to address this issue of people go overboard with a lot of sins, but when it comes to this issue, they're extremely, they're very strict and so forth and so on. As it relates to the people who have the opinion that you can eat from this commercial meat that you purchase in Morrison's, these fast food places, they have a few adilla from the kitab and a few from the sunnah. From the Kitab, is a statement that is pretty clear. That's in Surah Al-Ma'idah, ayat number five. Allah begins the ayah by saying, اليوم أُحِلَّتْ لَكُمَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَتَعَامُ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ حِلٌّ لَكُمْ وَتَعَامُكُمْ حِلٌّ لَهُمْ On this day, the good things that are pure have been made halal for you. And the food of the people of the book is halal for you. And the food that you have is halal for them. So in that ayat, it's very clear that Allah Azza wa generally said, without any conditions, that the food of the people of Al Kitab is halal for us. Al Kitab are those people who believe in the Torah that was given to Musa, and the Christians who believe in the Injil that was given to Isa ibn Maryam. And whether they were Al Kitab during the time of the Prophet وسلم, during the time of the companions, during the time of the Tabi'een, or the followers of the Tabi'een, or after that, all the way up into this point, Allah didn't make any distinction. So if you come and you say, that's Ahlul Kitab during that time and not during this time, then you have to bring the proof of that. So some of the scholars and some of the people, they make distinctions and they say, these are not Ahlul Kitab. But we'll come to that because the people who feel that this is impermissible, they do have some strong things to say in this regard. We're just saying it's not permissible for us to make distinctions between Ahl Kitab. Marrying their women, eating from their food, we only make conditions that are given in Kitab and the Sunnah as some conditions have been given here, as you're going to see, inshallah. So this ayah by itself, says that the food of Ahlul Kitab is permissible for you. And it didn't say, does he pray? Does he say, Isa is the son of Allah? It doesn't say anything about that individual, how he slaughtered the meat. Did he say, Bismillah? Did he say, it doesn't say anything. It said that their food is halal. To eat their bread, to eat their sweets and their candy, to eat their food is halal. The food of the meat, the meat is just like everything else. Because the ayat is general. To the point where some of the salaf, especially from the tabi'een, great, tremendous scholar, Imam Ata, another scholar, Qasim ibn Mukhaybara. These people said, based on this ayat, if a person from Ahlul Kitab were to slaughter the meat and say in the name of the Masih, Isa ibn Maryam, then you can still eat it. Because Allah said in the Quran, وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ النَّسِيَّةِ Your Lord was not forgetful. Allah knew back then, when he revealed this ayat, allowing people to eat their food, Allah knew what they were going to believe in, and Allah knew what they were going to be doing. But he still left the verse general. So now, you guys got to pay attention here. For the person who wanted, wants to be very strict in this, on other people. Is being strict on yourself, no problem. But being strict on other people and judgmental towards other people? The scholar from the Tabi'een, Ata, was of the opinion, based upon this ayah today, the food of the people before you is halal for you. This food of the Yehud and the Nasara 
is halal for you. To the point if one of them saw it in the name of other than Allah. I don't agree with that position. The Quran is against that position as you're going to see. But that was his understanding and that was his position. Why did he take that position? Because he's saying that the ayat is very clear. This particular ayat. But we know that there are other ayats that may explain this ayat and so forth and so on. But the point I want you to appreciate, to take on board is, that was his understanding to that degree. And not only him. Not only him. And Imam al-Tabari and his tafsir of the Quran concerning this particular issue, he brings the names of a number of the ulama who took this position. Al-Kitab, khalas, you can eat their food. Another delil that they use is a principle that we've mentioned a number of times, and this principle, inshallah, will keep coming to you. It's a principle you have to foster, you have to understand it, make sure comprehension of fiqh, generally speaking, as it relates to your personal life, it makes your life easier to understand positions of fiqh. And that is the principle that the general rule is everything is permissible, everything, except where the delil comes and make it impermissible. What they call in the circles of fiqh between the ulama al bara'atul al asliya. Everything is permissible. This thing is permissible for me to use it, the color. To wear this, all of this is permissible. What I can't eat, what I can't drink, what I can't wear, there has to be some delil. If there's no delil, then I can wear any color, I can wear any style, I can wear anything, I can drink, eat, I can sit however I want. If we don't have that principle, people are going to come and they're going to make haram things as they like. So in order to say, you can't sit like that, Akhi, you have to be able to bring proof to show him why you can't sit like that. You can't drink like that. You have to bring proof. You can't drink that thing. You can't eat that thing. You can't put your hair like that. Everything is permissible in the dunya. Everything is halal. Everything. Except what the delil comes and says, no, this thing is not permissible. So this is one of the proofs that these people take. Is that the ayat right here that we just told you? The ayat said it was permissible. So if anybody else comes to say it's haram, they have to bring the clear proof. The clear proof. And that's why we have the ikhtilaf. The third proof, ikhwani, is another important issue. Very important. So you got to pay attention. It's the hadith of our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. The people who believe it's permissible to eat this commercial meat. And from them are some major scholars doing our time. Like the Sheikh Muhammad ibn Uthaymeen. You can go back in the internet and you can see very clearly without apologizing to anyone. Being a jurist with fiqh, he stands strong on this issue. He's not the only one, but he does it based on knowledge. You don't have to, just, you don't have to accept every position that he's taken, but hey, it's clear what he's saying. So the third point is the fact that Aisha said, may Allah be pleased with her, that a group of people came to Aisha and they said to her, sometimes we are given meat by a group of other people and we don't know that this meat that they're giving to us has been slaughtered with the name of Allah or not. What should we do? So they waited until the Prophet came, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Aisha told him the story. The Prophet told those people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sammu wa kulu. You say Bismillah and then just eat it. If you didn't know how it was slaughtered, then you say Bismillah and then you eat it. So the people who take this position say this is a clear proof that these people who are Ahlul Kitab and they say that in the issue of these commercial places that sell this meat, the country is a Christian country. So we're going to give the ruling to the majority. When the prime minister is sworn in, the majority, when the prime minister is sworn in, they give him the Bible, they give him this from the queen. She appoints the, she's the queen of England, she appoints that guy, the, um, the um, you know, all of those important Christian people in their religion. So those people said, you give that ruling. That's open for dispute, and we'll come to that, inshallah. But anyway, the point here. This particular hadith, khwani, in reality, we have to be careful with the hadith because in another narration, it makes it clear what was the condition of the people 
who brought that meat, who gave it to the Muslims. So the people who say that this meat is permissible, and a lot of people hold this one as their delil, people in the audience, people who eat that meat. The hadith said, a group of people came to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We are given meat by some other people, and we don't know, they're from Ahl, they, we're given meat by other people. We don't know if they said Bismillah or not. Prophet Muhammad said, you don't know what they did with it, how they slaughtered it, whether they say Bismillah or not. You say Bismillah and you eat it. So go to McDonald's, go to Burger King, wherever. You don't know what they said, how it was slaughtered. You say Bismillah and go and eat it. And this is one of the main delils of the people doing our time, especially that eat that food. As a release explanation of that hadith is being used in the wrong place because the people who were giving these people the meat, they were new Muslims. They were new Muslims who were brand spanking new in the religion. And as a result of that, these people who had been Muslim for some time, they weren't sure. They weren't sure. What is the situation with these new Muslims? Are they still just slaughtering the meat like they did in Jahiliya if they even may not? Or they may be mentioning the name of Allah by mistake. Or they don't mention Allah's name at all. But they're new Muslims. We're worried. Do they know the ruling or they do not know the ruling? So the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, knowing that this could be the reality, you people say Bismillah and eat it. So that goes to show if a Muslim has doubt about whether another Muslim's food is halal or not halal, he shouldn't ask him. He is giving food and he has some doubt about a Muslim. He says, Bismillah and he eats it. As for someone from Ahlul Kitab, this is not the issue. These are two different issues. There's two different issues right here. So to use this particular hadith to support this, you should know that the real background of the issue is that those people were Muslims. And the hadith of the Nabi is clear. Number of hadith. Men salla salatana wa staqbala qiblatana wa akala dhabihatana fadhaq al-Muslim. Lahu mal al-Muslimi wa alayhi ma alayhi. Anyone who prays the prayer that we pray, the five prayers, he prays the prayers that we pray, Juma'i, the prayers that we pray. Anyone who faces our qibla when he prays, anyone who accepts and eats our dhabiha, then that person is a Muslim. He gets the rights that Muslims have over him and they have rights over him. So the point here is, if he's not sure about what the Muslim is doing, then he says, Bismillah. As for Ahlul Kitab, this shouldn't be used here. Lastly, Khwani, in regards to the issue of the people who see the permissibility of eating the meat from Ahlul Kitab, is the general ease that Al-Islam has given to the Muslims. And I agree with this to a certain degree, that if a person is living in America, as I have in a state called Illinois, a person is living in somewhere in this country far away from the mainstream Muslims, he's far, far away. And it's difficult for that individual to get access to meat that's been slaughtered in the name of Allah because it's so difficult. We're not going to tell that man he has to become a vegetarian. We're not going to tell that individual, you can only eat fish. We're not going to tell him that. The ease of Islam, inshallah, will open up the door for him due to necessity. Because he doesn't want to be a vegan. He doesn't want to be a vegetarian. So the ease of Islam may allow him. Because why is Islam going to tell me I have to go 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12 miles to drive somewhere to bring halal food back? Is that what Allah wants? If he has the ability to do that and it's easy for him, then do it. But I believe Al-Islam is easier than that. Islam came with all of those ayat that Allah clearly made things easy for the people to worship him. Those are the main delils, Khwani, from the people who say that it is permissible to eat the food of the people of the book. It's permissible to eat the food of the people of the book. As for the people who say it's not permissible, in my opinion, their position is safer and their position is stronger and their position has stronger and more clearer delils that explain those other positions. From those, Adillah, and it's quite a few, inshallah, we won't do all of them, is the prohibition in the Quran, again, in Surah Al-An'am, Al-An'am, ayat number 121, Allah Ta'ala mentioned, وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا do not eat any food, any meat that the name of Allah was not mentioned upon it.
Don't mention any meat like that. So when these people use the verse of the Quran that says, Today the food of the people of the book is permissible for you. Yes, the people of the book, when they slaughter correctly, their food is permissible for you. But if they mention other than the name of Allah, as you're going to see, or they don't mention the name of Allah, like in this case, then it's not permissible. So this commercial food, this commercial meat, we say you shouldn't eat it. Because we don't know the slaughterer, is he from Ahl al-Kitab? And we don't know also how he slaughtered, and that's going to come up, inshallah. But we will say, if there's a Jewish place and they're eating kosher, then that's from the Ahl al-Kitab that you can eat. Because although the Jews are blamed for their ghulu, and they go overboard, in the way some of them make the food kosher, the meat, they have to have a special utensil, a special person has to come. For the people who are involved in a ruqya, we always get calls. Who do you advise me to go to to do the ruqya? You do the ruqya yourself. Read Surah Al-Fatiha. Read Ayat Al-Kursi. Read what you know from the Quran. Our community says, no, no. I want a raqi. You have to send me. Hey, hey, hey. Just let your wife do it. Let your son do it. You do it yourself. No. He has to go and find someone. This is the way of the Jews. I don't say it's haram, but when it comes to slaughtering, they have to have a special person with a special knife. If you don't bring that person, then the food is not permissible. They won't eat that food. Our religion is not like that. Only one person is going to be the person who's going to make the food permissible for us. Any and everybody. Every Amr, Bakr, and Zayd in our religion. The woman can slaughter for their aid and other than that. And that food is halal. Not to mention the man slaughtering for his own self. So I only wanted to mention that at 24 awareness. To raise your awareness. I'm not against the Raqi who does it according to the Sunnah. And he doesn't steal the people's money. But why you have to pay for Ruqi and his free. To do the thing that the Jews do. That mentality. So the food of the Yehud. No doubt is permissible. The Yehud who say this is kosher. And you're not responsible. And I'm not responsible for going to say, show me the video, how you people slaughtered it. That's not our job. They have the sign, kosher. The government says, if you say something is kosher, you say something is halal, and you're lying, you're breaking the law. So we're allowed to believe that. So the kosher food, permissible. The Christian slaughtering, you go somewhere, he is somewhere, and he slaughters, and you see that. Where we want to slaughter, we go. A Christian is slaughtering for the people to help the thing go quicker and he's slaughtering it the correct way then we take that as for this commercial food we don't know who's slaughtering it and we don't know how it was slaughtered another delil and they have a lot a lot is what Allah Ta'ala mentioned when he made haram so many types of meats in the Quran this is a really important ayat. From the strongest proofs that we shouldn't eat that food. Surah Al-Ma'idah again. Allah Ta'ala mentioned haram for you to eat is the meat that is a carcass. It died. It's just dead. Died by itself. It's just dead. You can't eat that. Nor can you eat blood. The meat where the blood is still in there. You're actually eating it. Bloody. You can't eat that. You can't eat the khanzir, the pig. And you can't eat any food that other than the name of Allah was mentioned on it. So that's a refutation against what Atta said. May Allah be pleased with him. When he said, this ayat allows us to eat the food of Ahlul Kitab. Even if they say in the name of Jesus. Just as we're allowed to marry their women. Although she may say Jesus is the son of Allah. But this ayah said, you can't eat food that other than the name of Allah has been mentioned. Now pay attention. The ayah went on to say, any animal that was strangled, you can't eat the food. And any animal that was bludgeoned, he was hit hard and violently killed. Can't eat that food. And you can't eat the food of an animal that fell off a high place and he died as a result of falling. Broke his back, his spine, he died. Or the animal that was gored by another animal. Now we come to the second part of this ayah that is important. 
illa ma akala sabu wa ma akala sabu illa ma dhakaytum and haram for you to eat pay attention is the animal that was killed by a wild animal a lion a tiger hyena something killed him Allah said but if you're able to slaughter it before it dies then you can eat it so if there's an animal that's been attacked by a lion and the lion left him and he's still living and you came and you slaughtered him and said bismillah and that's what took his life now you can eat that but if you didn't get there before that time he's a dead carcass so these scholars at Hwani use this ayat from two angles and two points and the first point is the ayat said number one from three points you can't eat dead animals so when you slaughter the animal by chopping his head off and doing all that that animal is dead you didn't do it the right way the other point is can't eat an animal that's been bludgeoned violently killed the way these people do smash his head in he's on a machine that goes by and the saw cuts his head off dropping them from high places electrocuting them drowning them all of that stuff is not even humane can't even treat animals like that as the prophet told us وسلم, that everybody who's going to slaughter he should sharpen his knife so as to spare the animal suffering if you cause the animal to suffer like that you render the animal impermissible so if the Ahlul Kitab person is killing the animal that way, that's the second thing that was mentioned. First, the animal that is dead. You can't eat him. The animal that's been bludgeoned, violently killed. And the third point here is, if you catch an animal, and that animal has been eaten partially by wild animals, but you caught him enough time to... That goes to show the importance of a dhabiha. That if you don't make the dhabiha, it's not permissible. But if you can get in there... And you can make an animal that's about to die. He's about to die. But you caught him before he died and you did the biha. What about? What about? What about? It shows the importance of the animal that's just walking around. It shows you the importance of a the biha. That is the, the biha the right way. That causes the animal to become halal. And not just killing the animal and the person just saying he's from Ahlul Kitab. That's from the Adilla. Also, Khwani, very, very important point is what happened with Ali bin Abi Talib. During the khilaf of Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib made it impermissible for the Muslims to eat the meat of the Christians from an Arab tribe called Beni Taglab. They were a tribe of Arabs who were Bedouins and they were on Christianity. But they only knew about Christianity just drinking khamr. They didn't give any consideration to Allah is Isa, Isa is Allah. They didn't give any consideration to no Injil. They didn't care about going to no Kenisa or building Kenisas. They didn't care about anything. The only thing they knew about their Christianity was getting drunk. Because in Christianity, you can drink. Uh, they have this thing called communion, where you drink wine, and it's symbolic of drinking the blood of Jesus. I don't know how that makes sense, but that's what they do. And in certain churches, they allow people to drink. But in other churches, they'll replace the wine with Kool-Aid, with juice, Ribena, for the youngsters or people who don't drink. So this is what this tribe were doing. So they were Bedouins on Christianity, but this is all they did. Ali ibn Abi Talib, based upon that, said, these people are not really Ahlul Kitab. They have nothing to do with Christianity other than that Khamr. That's it. So he told the community, you can't eat their food. Can't eat the other biha. Now, if that was the position of Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu, because of the practices and understanding of Beni Taghla, this is the same way Ahlul Kitab are here today. The people from Ahlul Kitab who we work with, we don't know if they're Christians even. We just assume because they're white people, for an example. It's like looking at a Sikh or looking at a person who comes from India, one of those places, Sri Lanka, you can't automatically know where he comes from necessarily. Those, some of those people are Christians, some of them are Sikhs, some of them don't believe in Allah, anything other than that. So we can't assume just because a person is white, he's a Muslim, or because he's white, he's a Christian or a Jew, you can't assume that. And how many of them are practicing their religion? How many of them? Their religion is just occasions, parties, many of the people. 
So if Ali took that position, that's the same position we should take with these people today and not doing the opposite. The opposite is we're living in their country. It's a Christian country. They're the majority. At McDonald's, at Morrison's, if you go in there, when you go for the job, they're not asking the guy who purchases Morrison. They're not asking the consortium or a group of people going to purchase that franchise. They don't ask them and they don't people, let people know what's your religion. There's no way of, in the world saying that everyone who owns a professional football team in the Premier League, he's a Christian because they're in the UK. You know, people own those teams. who are not Christians. They're not Jews. Man is from China, for an example. So that's a bit stretching it, although some of the ulama, they said that. As I told you, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, that's his position. That Islam didn't send us where we have to go behind the counter at that store and we have to ask the people, hey, who owns this store? Is he a Christian or a Jew? That's not your job. Your job is just to take things on face value and just to deal with it like that. But again, we live here and we know the reality of it. Just because a person lives here doesn't mean he's from Ahlul Kitab. So that's one of the strong proofs of Khwani for the people who take that position. There are some other positions, but again, this is not really a complicated issue. I just think that we need to be balanced in it. If you took either position, don't be rough and tough with people. And if you took the position that it's permissible to eat that stuff, then you have to ask yourself, what are you relying upon and what are you depending upon? And you can't be one of those people who say, well, big scholar said it, so I'm going to do it. You have to do it because you're convinced that this is something that is permissible. And you shouldn't do it because you're convinced that it's something that's not permissible. And then we always have the position that the Muslim always has to be willing to take. Very, the halal is clear, the haram is clear, and between them is the gray area. Not many people know about it. So whoever avoids the gray area, he has saved his religion. I don't necessarily say this issue is a gray area because as I mentioned, people took both sides. But if you didn't eat that meat and we're living here in Birmingham, we can get food from the Muslims in Birmingham just as good, if not better, than the food from these commercial people. Just as good, if not better. It's just that the culture, McDonald's, Burger King, that thing that we do. If our children were in the car, and we went home and we said, okay, guys, I'm convinced we can eat this meat of al kitab and they're all al kitab Our children would be really happy because they think they're missing out on something that's really good in life because it's part of living in the West and so forth and so on. They really would think that the McDonald's burger takes better than the burger that he gets that his mother makes with the love of the mother. And she also is a better cook. She makes a better burger. But he'll prefer the burger from McDonald's because of that whole mentality. Just be balanced. Now we're going to open up the floor, Ekhwani, for your questions because I would assume that there are a lot of questions that are going to come. People are going too far, too deep about things like cross-contamination. What happens if the blood over here gets over here and the knife used over here is used over here and so forth and so on? We kind of like go a bit too far. Islam didn't tell us if you slaughtered the animal over here with a knife and he's a pig or it has blood, and then you take that same knife and slaughter one bismillah. Now that becomes haram because that blood touches his blood, so you got to throw that whole animal away. Islam didn't teach us that. That animal is permissible to eat, provided you just clean that pig blood off of it. Make sure you clean, clean whatever blood is haram that got mixed with it, whatever products are haram that got mixed with it. Just separate that stuff and eat what has been clearly slaughtered in the name of Allah and for Allah. Okay, if you guys have any questions, inshallah, you can put your questions forward or any comments, even you can put your comments forward, inshallah, for 10 minutes. I didn't do come shake. Fadl, ya ah, fadl.
The Prophet, he mentions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a group, a man came, uh, Abu Thalaba al Khushani, may Allah be pleased with him. He said he came to the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and said, Ya, Ya Rasulullah, I come from the land where Ahlul Kitab are. These people are from Ahlul Kitab. I come from their land. And in that land, I hunt with my bow. And I hunt also with my dog that is trained and with my dog that is not trained. So in the Quran, the dog that is trained and he's called Al-Mu'allama, Al-Mu'allama from the word Ilm. So even the dog that is trained, who has knowledge, is raised in Al-Islam. So what about the human being? So he said, that dog that is trained, he goes out, and my dog that's just a house dog, he just hang out, whatever, he goes, and when I come to the animal, I find that the animal is dead. I don't know which animal killed it. Was it my animal that's trained, the one that's trained, or the one that's not trained? What should I do? This issue is not really connected to the subject, eating commercial food. But the man was in Ahlul Kitab's land, and he mentioned that. The Nabi wasallam told him, eat the food that you know, your dog that is trained killed it, and, the food, and keep the untrained dog away from the food. Meaning, don't eat that food. Make sure that you know that is the trained dog that killed that food and keep the untrained dog away from that food. So that hadith, and the Imam Muslim brought that hadith as well in the chapter of the whole chapter of hunting with the trained dog and the, not, the dog that is not trained. So the person just has to have wara and when he's in doubt and he doesn't know what the situation is, then he has to just make a call here based upon that hadith. Good question, Akhi. Any more questions, Juan? Fadl ya akhi. Concerning the issue of stun meat, I don't think it's our job and our responsibility when we go to the butcher to ask them all of these real deep details the people who are working in that industry they are the ahl of that industry they're the people of that industry so when they do things we're not responsible for going deep into details and asking them all what they do we expect and we trust that they're doing the right thing so stunning the animal is something that should be avoided because it prolongs the death and who knows what he's going through the hadith is clear of the prophet and Ali Imam know we brought it in his uh, uh, 40 hadith and he made it from the Jawami al Kalim. So much knowledge in it, showing how Al Islam has rahmah to the animals and pays attention to the rights of animals. So, when slaughtering animals, you're not allowed to slaughter the animal in front of his kids, his wife, his, you know, the babies that he has, that she has. You should take her somewhere else. You shouldn't be allowing all of them to be looking while some are getting slaughtered because that's terrorizing them. So the hadith is pretty clear. In Allah katab al ihsan ala kulli shay' fa idha qataltum fa ahsinu al qitla wa idha dhabahtum fa ahsinu al qit al dhibha wa liyuhid ahadakum shafratahu wa liyurih dhabihata. Verily Allah has written perfection on everything. Do everything perfect. So when you kill kill well and when you slaughter slaughter well. Get him out. And let each and every one of you sharpen the life so as to spare the animal from suffering. But if a person were to slaughter him by stunning him, and then they slaughtered him, this gets the hukum of the wild animal. You got him before he died. But what about the possibility? Maybe he died before the slaughter took place. We're not responsible for that. We're not responsible for those maybes. Our life is not like that. We judge things based upon what is apparent. So if we had a credible, reputable, person who worked there, my brother, someone, Zakat Allah, used to work there, and he came and said, you know, 80% of those animals, they die. Something like that happened to cause us concern, then we'll take that. But we're not going to fall into what Quraysh fell into. One of the big problems that Quraysh did is they used to make halal what Allah didn't make halal, and they used to make haram on the people what Allah didn't make haram. And this was a big problem of Quraysh. 
Not only did they worship other than Allah and they worshiped idols and they buried their daughters alive and they were racist and the strong ate the weak. Not only all of that, they drank khamar and all of that. One of the big things that they used to do, the Quran came in ayat, telling them don't do this, is they made things halal from the meat. They said our women can't eat this. Uh, these ones can't eat that. Our slaves can't eat that. So many ayat was revealed. They were revealed in this regard. قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةُ اللَّهِ الَّتِي أَخْرَجَ لِعِبَادِهِ وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الرِّزْقِ قُلْ هِيَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا خَالِسَةً يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ Say to them, Muhammad, who is the one who has the nerve, the audacity to make haram the beautiful things, the pure things that Allah brought forth and what he provided his servants with from the risk. Who makes that haram? Allah said, no, these things are halal for the belief, for everybody, but yawm al-qiyamah, they'll be only for the believers. So there are a lot of ayat. Am lahum shuraka, shara'u lahum min ad malam ya'dhim bihi la. Do they have, Quraysh, have they made themselves into partners with Allah? They make legislation as they want along with Allah? So that stunned meat can possibly die. We, we don't go down that path. We don't go down that path. It's not for me to determine that. If there's no clear proof, don't worry about that. So we should get out of this thing that these butchers have between themselves. If the guy is saying that it's halal, it's your, you just, it's, that's on him, Yom Muki. I'm like the imam. He gets the salat right. He'll get the reward, you get the reward. He gets that salat wrong, it's against him and it's for you. Because you, didn't, you don't know, it's not my job. You remember that time in Khwani they were selling people horse meat? A few years ago they were selling people horse meat. <laughs> I, I don't have to go in the laboratory, me and my sons, my wife, we, got, we have the, the, the scope and we put the laham there and we're going to find, yet yeah, this, has, this has horse meat in it. And it was prevalent in this country. Prevalent. If you just eat, if you ate the horse meat, inshallah, it's not going to kill you, and you're, nef you're definitely not doing something haram because you don't know what's going on. Now, next brother over here, he had his hand up. Fuck them. Person, he's really from Ahlul Kitab. And he slaughters, but he doesn't mention the name of Allah upon it. I say you shouldn't eat that if you, if you are uh, exposed to that. You shouldn't eat it. Because the ayat is clear. Don't, don't, don't eat any meat that other than that the name of Allah is not pronounced over it. The other ayat said, Don't eat any meat. That was made that a name of other than Allah was pronounced. So there's a distinction which goes to show you shouldn't do it. One ayah said, don't eat the meat that other than the name of Allah is on it. And this one said, don't eat the meat that Allah's name was not pronounced on it. So if he didn't say anything, Allah's name is not pronounced over it or on it. So it should be avoided according to the people who take that position. Any more questions, Ikhwani? Yeah, that's a good question, Akhi. The scholars of Al-Islam, they used to change positions from the companions and the tabi'in, and that's the nature of the human being. And Imam Abu Hanif used to tell the people, Ya, way, way haq, Ya, Abba Ya'qub. Abu Ya'qub woe unto you. He saw him writing his notes. He said, I say something today, and then I change my opinion tomorrow. I'm a human being. I take this position today, then I change it tomorrow. This particular day, I believe that the niqab is wajib, and tomorrow, I'm convinced that it's not wajib, but it doesn't sit easy with me. And then I go back to my original position. And then I sit with someone who talks to me and I took the other position. So I'm wavering back and forth based upon trying to do the best thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because that's what happened to the Imams. And Imam and Shafi'i, our Somali brothers would tell you who are on the Shafi'i Madhab. And Imam and Shafi'i had a Madhab that was Jadid and one that is Qadim. So when... He was at the beginning, he would take position. Later on, after traveling, meeting so, other, so many people from the ulama, he took another position. So when people say, this is in the Shafi Madhab, the Shafi person knows that's not enough. Which Madhab of Imam Shafi? 
the first one or the second one, because it changes position. And that's normal and natural, because knowledge is not jammed. Knowledge is not like this, Ikhwani. You have to take a medhab and stick with the medhab. You're going to keep changing your position. Last thing about this issue, Akhi Karim's good question. As for the one who changes his position based upon desires, then this is blameworthy. Right now, he's convinced. Or his way is, that meat is haram. Hit him in the head meat. They hit him in the head, they kill him. That meat is haram. I don't eat the hit him in the head meat. But when he gets there, with it, you say, well, it is a definite opinion, so I'm going to do it. This shouldn't be done. Because he believes the other opinion. He believes the other opinion. So we can't be like those people who jump back and forth on opinions that are halal or haram based upon the desires. If you do that, you'll become a heretic. I'm going to take the position because an imam said it. So if the imam said that, drinking khamar is permissible as long as you don't get drunk. I'm going to take that position. So all of the scholars used to warn about this type of tatabur, this type of following the position based upon your desires. Any more questions, Ikhwani? I think their situation is much more clearer than ours because Africans, Latin Americans, everybody but Europeans are more devoted and committed to Christianity than Europeans are themselves. This is the real weird thing. That the God of the Christians is a European God, the way they show him. He's a white God, the angels are white, and so forth and so on. But usually it's the people of color who are more committed to Christianity than Europeans themselves. Like those places you just mentioned. In Mexico, these people are trying to be religious. So in Mexico, when you see someone slaughtering, you are more inclined, you'll be more correct to believe he's a Christian. You'll be more correct. But we're not in Mexico and we ain't dealing with those Mexicans. We're talking about right here in the UK. What is it for us as it relates to these commercial places? If you're going to Mexico, then inshallah there's someone from Ahl Sunnah there in Mexico. He can help you over there. I understand this is just knowledge, hypothetical, but let us deal with our situation. Because I wouldn't say the same thing with the Mexicans. That you can't assume everyone here is a Christian. Because in Mexico, it's a, different, it's a different reality. It's a different reality. And fatwas of the ulama, they change from time to time, from place to place, from people to people. Because again, knowledge is not jamit. What's the word for jamit, Ikhwani? It's not rigid. Knowledge is not rigid. Knowledge is flexible. How to do this and when not to do and so forth and so on. As Sheikh Khalid. One of the reasons for that, Sheikh Khalid, is because people take that position and say it's permissible to eat their food is there is an ayat that said you can eat their food. There is an ayat. The same ayat said that you can marry their women as well. The same ayat said you can marry their women. But there's ikhtilaf. Some people said, no, you can't marry their women because they're not really al-kitab. And others said, no, you can marry their women. Because the level of the Ahlul Kitab is not your business. So the people who took that position is because the ayat is clear. But that general ayat, that general ayat, it is made to be restricted by the other ayat, in my opinion. The other ayat that says the other side. Yes, you can eat the food of Ahlul Kitab if they slaughter it the right way that they slaughter, like the Yehud then there's no doubt you can eat the food of Ahl kitab You can marry the lady from Ahl kitab based upon the condition. The woman who's a Jew or Christian who is virtuous and upright and she's not going out being lewd. But if she's from Ahl kitab and she's had a relationship with this one and that one and that one and that one and that one, you can't marry her. 
So you can't marry her open-ended. There's a conditional clause. You can marry her if she is upright and chaste. And you can eat their food if they slaughter it the correct way. You can eat this animal that's been eaten and devoured by a lion or some bears. He's about to die. But you can eat him if you can slaughter him. That's a conditional clause. If you can do it before he dies. So they have their delil. And I believe that the other delils explain those delil. As I told you, they said, some people gave them some meat. They said, we don't know. Did they slaughter or not? So the prophet said, you say bismillah. You don't have to know how did they slaughter or who slaughtered. No, we said this is not applicable. These were Muslims, not from Ahlul Kitab. These were Muslims who came to them. So if my brother, this happened between me and my brother, I get invited, I go to his house. He's a brand new spanking new Muslim, brand new. He puts in front of me a burger. But it doesn't have the McDonald's package. It doesn't have a big Wampa pack thing on it. And he put that burger in front of me. And a strawberry milkshake. And I looked at that. I say, man, I know this looks like Burger King to me because I saw Burger King before. I know what it looks like. But I don't want to hurt his feelings. And I don't want to be rude. You know how we're sensitive to our relatives. We're sensitive. They want to take pictures of the baby. And I don't want them to take pictures. But if I make a big deal about it, the lady, the wife, the mother's going to be in trouble. So we are always wrestling with, wrestling with these issues. This is one of the issues. So I'm going to eat that burger, I'm going to eat that burger that looks like McDonald's and all of that. I'm going to eat it. Although I have that shubha. This looks like McDonald's. I don't think we could eat that. But it ain't my job. It could be his wife made that burger. It could be that his wife made that burger that he brought it from some Muslim store. It could be. He's a Muslim. So I'm going to eat it not to make him hurt, harm his heart. To keep the brotherhood between me and him. And so forth and so on. Someone may come and say, I would never eat it. I don't blame you. It's a shubha. But for me, I believe that the religion allows you to do this because he's a Muslim. But Ahlul Kitab, they were not Ahlul Kitab. Okay, last question. Any more questions, Akhwani? Over in the corner, and this is it, inshallah. Now, the brother is asking a legitimate question, and it's a valid point, but I don't think it's applicable. Since we're saying that we don't know who these people are, we don't know what religion these people are, it doesn't automatically mean a person is a Christian or a Jew because there's a Christian country, so therefore, the one who owns McDonald's and all these is a Christian or a Jew. Where do we get that from? So taking that position, aren't we being doubtful? Aren't we being doubtful? And everything that is... In the dunya is halal until the lil comes and so forth and so on. We say no. We're not saying that they're not Ahlul Kitab. We're saying we don't know. You don't know if they are Ahlul Kitab and you don't know if they're not Ahlul Kitab. You don't know how they're slaughtering the meat. If they, are they slaughtering the meat? We know actually, we have an idea that some of these people are definitely slaughtered. Some meats are being slaughtered in a bad way from the non Muslims, from one of the categories of meats you shouldn't eat. The one that's bludgeoned, violently hit with something. We know that's a fact. So, with that being the case, I don't know what he is. I follow that hadith. Leave what you doubt for what you don't doubt. I doubt that. So I'm going to be safe. As for the Muslim, this is the guy who's selling whatever he's selling. I can't be doubtful about that. Uh, Morrison's, they sell halal food. So when I go to Morrison's and I see the halal corner, I'm not doubting that. I'm not doubting that. I believe that this is halal. So I'm not going to say to them, prove it to me. It has the stamp. We as Muslims know that some of these Muslims who are stamping this, they're selling to Morrison's. We know that. It's part of our culture. Something we know. It's not ambiguous to us. So it's not like we're against those people just because we don't know. We say we don't know if they are, if they're not. So it's better to leave that and not say that they are Ahlul Kitab. Where, where's the proof of that? And even if they are Ahlul Kitab, what are the chances that they're like the Beni Taglab? 
The chances are more than not that they like Beni Tagla. They don't know anything about their religion other than drinking khamr. They don't know anything about their religion other than Halloween. Nothing about their religion other than the Christmas tree. They do everything that's haram. Everything. But they are Christians just when they're going to get a job, they check it. That's all. He's from the BNP or whatever. He says, I'm not a Muslim. So that's, that's more likely to be the case. So we avoid it. Okay, Ikhwani, we're going to stop here. Inshallah ta'ala. We ask Allah ta'ala to give us fiqh in the deen, make things easy for us. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyina wa ala alihi wa sahabi ajma'in. And I want to apologize to little Ayyub. I actually forgot that he was with me. And I ran into the masjid and left that guy outside. And while I was praying, while I was praying, I don't know, Shaitan, the thought came to me. I said, that boy may be in Morrison's right now. So I want to apologize to little Ayyub, okay? We don't want him not to love coming to the masjid. Barakallah Hey, I'll waste the things a lot, man. <laughs>